Well, first of all, thank you all very much for coming out, and thank you very much for having me. One of the, one of the things you learn over a, a long career is to uh, never trust your enemies, but certainly and absolutely never trust your friends. So when Bill asked me if I would come and give this address, I said yes, I would be more than happy to do so. Um, but then when I asked him more specifically as time got closer what I should really talk about and say, he became less and less communicative, <laughs> le less and less detailed. And then he finally, and I knew the jig was up then, he finally began to tell me that I was good enough at this business that I could handle it anyway. That's a sure sign that you're on your own. <laughs> Anyway, it is great to be here, and of course I have been to this university, this amazing university and campus on previous occasions. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues here, and have had many discussions with those friends and colleagues about matters of mutual interest. Not exclusively, but certainly predominantly, the discussions I have had of mutual interest have centered on the issues of conservation. I personally do not believe, nor have I ever believed, as far as I can remember, that there was any more important endeavor in human existence than this effort we call conservation. I do believe that it is not only one of the greatest ideas that we have ever promulgated, but I think it is probably the one that, as time proceeds through this 21st century, and long before we get to the middle or the end of it, perhaps many, many other people in both industrialized and non-industrialized nations of the world will come to agree and understand that what we do around and about and with this wonderful notion will determine the stability, the comfort, the quality of human life going forward. And it will also determine the richness of the wild others that share this planet with us. I think it is very important that I give you some understanding of my personal philosophy, which has matured over time. I haven't been a complete mushroom. I do learn a little bit as I grow at age. Um, but it has never really fundamentally changed. And the most important thing you need to understand about what I'm going to say going forward is that I don't really see much difference between us and them. I am a person who has participated in the harvest of wild creatures because I come from Newfoundland and the culture there is a fishing and hunting culture. And I have done it outside of those circumstances. But I am not afforded the luxury of saying that they are so different from us, the moose I hunt, or the bear I hunt, or the birds I hunt, or the animals I catch, the fish and eat. I am not afforded the luxury that some have of believing they are somehow miraculously different from us, and therefore the experience is somehow different for them. I cannot be afforded that. I will not abide by that idea. I think it is manifestly ridiculous. And so I take my association with conservation and with the rest of the natural world extremely personally. This is to the disconcert of some and the uncomfortability of some, but I can assure you I am not alone in these feelings. And I believe the more we are able to understand what we share with the rest of animate creation, the more likely we are to do good things for it. I am also, however, a deep believer in the necessity of ensuring the quality of life for human beings. I am not, despite my love for them, anti-human. <laughs> On the contrary, I grew up in a culture where the great attributes of humanness generosity, kindness, humility, sharing, cooperation, 
were extended and manifest every day of my childhood and every day of my life, in fact, there. I was born on the island of Newfoundland. I was raised on the island of Newfoundland, and I will die on that island beyond any question. So just as I don't see any separation very much between them and us, I also, in a very strange way, also don't see any separation between us and them, or them and us, or me and all of that, humanity and the wild others of the planet. That is my personal philosophy, deeply embedded. It might as well be trapped in amber because it is immutable and it will not be changed by any arguments that I have ever encountered. And just to safeguard it, I'm not going to read any more in my life or listen to arguments because it might change how I feel. <laughs> my earliest experiences also help explain what I'm going to say today. My earliest experience that I can remember, and I am told I was three, was capturing bumblebees in jars off thistle bushes in the backyard of a place, in a, a, a house in a place called St. Anthony, on the very tip of the northern peninsula of Newfoundland. There were no roads, and there were still travel by dog team at that time. And I have only then a cascading series of memories of being with creatures all of my life. And like uh, a musician or an athlete, I got to stay a boy for a very long period of time because I got a job when I grew up, and that job put me out in wilderness for almost 25 years on extended periods of time every year where I lived, lived with wild animals. And all of that only reinforced more in me the capacities they have, the beauty they represent, the inspiration they convey, and the sheer desperate loneliness that would result if we were ever to lose them. Now at the same time, our relationships with them in modern time have become subjects of great debate. Should we engage in one way or another? What should our roles in conservation be? What should our models be? So let me talk about another experience from Newfoundland, this time that involves both a fascinating animal species and a fascinating aspect of, of Newfoundland culture. As most of you probably know, one of the most controversial engagements with wild nature in the world that we know of has, was the Newfoundland seal hunt. This was a practice that was carried out for 350 years out of necessity because nobody would do it otherwise, out of necessity on the east and northeast coast of the island of Newfoundland, where men would go out in ships, jump over the side, and all day long would walk across floating carpets of pack ice that were constantly floating underneath them, where one false step as you moved across these floating pans meant you went down into an abyss of salt cold water that killed you pretty well instantly. And you hunted seals on that ice and you skinned them, and you eviscerated them, and you brought back the meat, and you brought back the pelts, and you hoped that you survived the three, four, or five week journey that that represented. You lived in a circumstance of filth and cold and danger at a level that no one, really, who hasn't done it can appreciate, and makes me marvel at the heroes, who so-called, who pretend that any kind of modern hunting excursion is such an incredible challenge. Well, I would like them to look at the black and white photographs from the 1930s and so on to see what a dangerous hunt really looks like. The end result, of course, of the controversies over seal hunting meant that eventually the seal hunt in Newfoundland became essentially something virtually lost. And at the same time, and not long before, we experienced the collapse of the northern cod fishery. And so what happened in the homes, in the individual family dwellings, 
in the individual communities of that one culture, was that the men who were the ones who went to sea were suddenly at home with the ones who stayed at home to look after the home, the women in most cases in that culture. And they suddenly were completely out of their lives. And what they would do is they would get up early in the morning, the men, and they would go out to the wharves or walk around the communities so that when the school bus came for their children, their children would not see them sitting at the kitchen table, a sight they could never remember because their fathers were always gone before the light of day. And then the men would come home and they would stay there until such time as the school bus would come again at 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And then they would find something else to do at that time so that it wasn't so manifestly clear that their lives had been undone. Undone, in the case of cod, by an excessive slaughter of a fish species. Undone, in the case of the seal hunt, by the protestations of people who had a very different worldview and managed to essentially stop that hunt despite the fact that 7.2 million harp seals swim our waters. Some of you in this room are obviously still working your way early through the process of having a conservation agenda, a life, a career, and I set up these couple of small examples to try and impress the second great attribute of conservation, along with the fact that it is the most important idea we have ever conceived, and that is that it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily complex that involves the full range of emotions, of politics, of law, of differing value systems for people around the world, across the world, in a globalized world, and that the lives and livelihoods of people are intimately tied with the lives and livelihoods, if I may use that term, of wild nature, and that neither can really, at this point in time, really get along without the help of the other. Wildlife is no longer an accident on this planet, ladies and gentlemen. I can assure you, not in Africa, not in Asia, not on this continent, nowhere on this planet anymore is wildlife abundance or wildlife existence an accident. It will occur and they will be maintained by virtue of the decisions that human beings, at their best, in every culture and in every system, will make on their behalf for them, in their interests, while at the same time recognizing that in doing so we can help ourselves, but at the same time we must restrain ourselves. I am always amazed when people talk about conservation as though it is something easy to understand and as though you can be an expert in this business simply because maybe you have a goldfish at home, or because maybe you like to hunt ducks, or maybe because you're a rock climber, or maybe because you simply like to sit at the seaside and watch the dead jellyfish eventually float in. Well, unfortunately for the natural world and for all of us, I suppose, or maybe fortunately, Conservation is a complicated business that demands discipline, time, effort, knowledge, expertise, and unbelievable commitment to really try and make a difference in. That does not mean that conservation is a domain of elites. What it does mean, it's a domain of the committed. Very frequently, in lectures, the issues of leadership and the issues of why conservation matter 
arise. They may not be so explicitly detailed as it was in the actual title for this particular talk, but they arise everywhere. They arise in the media, they arise in lectures, they arise in, in, in classes, they arise in structured programs, because they really are the, the big questions. Are they, why does conservation matter on the one hand, and what kind of leadership do we need to achieve it? I'm not going to dwell on the issues of why conservation matters beyond the few opening comments that I made that it is capable of inspiring us. It is something we rely on physically and naturally, and it is something that enriches our lives, and that without a functioning natural world, we don't exist. Let us basically accept some of those arguments so we can get on to some of the other questions here. Let me only say, in the wake of that acceptance, if you agree, that we also must accept that the circumstances facing this planet, despite all the efforts of people in this room, of people like you in other rooms, at universities all over the world, in many businesses, in many homes, in many cultures, in many governments, despite the billions and billions and billions of dollars that we are spending, despite the incredible accumulation of science that we have, Despite all of that, you only have to check the latest month of publications or the latest announcements from reputable conservation organizations to realize that we remain in a battle. We remain in a battle for the conservation of the natural world. It may be hard to think so when one can look at the slopes of mountains in Montana and see cloaks of elk moving slowly in the morning sun. But it is not hard to imagine when somebody tells you that the insect life of Europe has fallen by 65 to 70 percent in the last 30 to 40 years. It is not difficult to understand when you understand that in all of Africa, all of the fabled continent of Africa, only about 33,000 wild lions live today. And that the pressures upon them and other iconic species in that, on that continent are extraordinary and demand everything that we can possibly devote to it to even halt them, let alone solve the problems. In the midst of all of that, it is possible for people to say, well, what can we do? What can we do with this massive, complex, difficult problem? What can I, as an individual sitting in this room, do? What can this university do? What can an organization like the Boone and Crockett Club do? What can the Nature Conservancy do? What can any of us do? Well, the, the truth is we can do a lot. And we have incredible examples all around the world, but we need not travel that far to understand that it is fully within the capacity of human beings to develop leadership and conservation that succeeds against all odds. We don't have to be driven just by passion and idealism, although I can assure you it doesn't hurt to have that fuel in your tank, because we can also use empirical evidence to show us the achievements that can be made. Bill, in his kind introduction to me, references a period of time in the past in this country, the United States of America, when wildlife depletion was the norm and when individuals who organized displays of the mounted heads and horns and forebodies of wild creatures from the American West and other parts of your country said to the citizens of the United States of America, come and see the vanishing wildlife of America, because in all likelihood, you will not see it for very long more. And on those walls were bison and pronghorn and mule deer, and elk, and caribou, and black bear, and a host of other species. And this was all at a time when America was driven by ideas of individualism, as you still are, 
by the idea of the right of the individual to do well and to have commercial gain unhindered by government, a time when religious attitudes firmly entrenched the notion that all people had dominion over nature, when at the time that even citizenship was being viewed as the preoccupation of individuals who took land from the wild and turned it into a domesticated agricultural version that they could live easily with. It was at a time when there were very few or no game laws. It was at a time when there were no university programs teaching wildlife science. It was a time when there were no state agencies. It was at a time where there were no funding mechanisms. It was a time where there were no academic journals dealing with these issues. And yet a handful of people, a handful of people, not just the people in the Boone and Crockett Club, or they were prominent, but a handful of them and others, set about to change the course of the history of this country in the matter of conservation. And somehow, somehow, they managed to build a system of conservation in your country that eventually became a model for the world. That included, yes, the sustainable use of wildlife, but also included the preservation of special places and special systems. That included a broad view of what wildlife was, not just species that could be hunted, but species that would never be hunted. That came to recognize that the great wild beauty of America was the actual system of art galleries and museums that did not exist inside buildings for you, as it did in Europe, but was actually played out in a wild, natural existence and landscapes. So people say, we face challenges today. We're worried about Endangered Species Acts, and we're worried about how we manage our forests, and we're worried about whether animals are listed or delisted, and we're worried about, you know, uh, all kinds of issues. We're worried about CWD, we're worried about diseases in wildlife and transmission to people, and, 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 and all of that seems completely out of our hands. It seems like we cannot make enough of a difference to win. But what was it about those people who launched this movement in this country so long ago? What was it that convinced people in the 1870s, 1870s, to set aside the lands of Yellowstone? What possibly could have been moving through their DNA, through their bloodstream, to get them to imagine that that was the thing to do at that time? And all of these other far-sighted views that these individuals had. I ask you a question. Do you believe that we today are asking those far-sighted questions? Or are we asking questions about smaller, closer issues and forgetting about the long-term implications of the decisions we make today? Are we forgetting about what your country will look like and what Canada will look like 50 years from now, 75 years from now? Are we making decisions in this great system of conservation established in your country inside these, these, these universities, inside these places of knowledge, and in our agencies and NGOs, are we asking those kinds of questions that seemingly those individuals 150 years ago had to have been asking themselves, or we wouldn't have the system we have. If the answer is yes, we are, I want you to write me. I want you to write me and tell me that experience you have had. If the answer is no, then the question we have to ask ourselves is why not? Because if we don't, we will soon reach the world of 25 years and 50 years, and the question will be this great idea of conservation 
where will we have taken it? I think there are three problems facing conservation in this world. Every problem I have ever looked at in the conservation realm, I have come to the conclusion falls into one of these elements, spheres of influence. The first is that too few people care. Too few of us care. The second is that those of us who do care are divided. We bring out a particular perspective, we bring out a particular way of looking at conservation, and then we believe that that is the right way to look at conservation, and anybody else who has a different view is looking at it somehow in the wrong way. And the third problem we have in conservation is that we are running out of money to do the things that are necessary for the natural world. I think almost all of the other things fit there. And so the question is, if we have too few people who care about conservation, why is that the case? Why do too few people care? Why is it that in your last presidential election and the last federal election in Canada, that the issues of conservation were virtually nowhere to be seen? If we really believe that conservation is about the future of humanity, the future of your country, the future of your economies, the future of all of that, then how is it that in our political systems in Canada and the United States and elsewhere in the world, this great idea seems to be off the political table? Well, I think that's just another manifestation of the fact that too few people care, because I can assure you if more people cared and were outspoken about that feeling and that emotion and that commitment to conservation, you better believe it would be on the political table. So that leads to the obvious question, if I'm right that too few people care, how do we make people care? How do we find a way to lead people, to inspire people, to have people care about the conservation of nature in the United States of America and in other nations around the world? Well, I come at this question in a lot of different ways. I come at this question and I ask myself, despite all of the efforts that we are making, despite all of the NGOs and all of the government programs and all of the things that we are exercising, we still feel that we need to do much more and we have evidence to indicate that we need to do much more. We are losing species, we are losing populations. In the last 50 years, we've lost 50% of the vertebrate biomass on this planet, 50% in 50 years. World Wildlife Fund report released only six months ago, recent data. Let's say it's wrong by a wide margin, it's still a pretty frightening thing. So we still have a long way to go. What is it going to take to get us there, and why haven't we gotten there already? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, and I think they are germane, and they pertain directly to conservation leadership. First of all, Grinnell and Roosevelt and Muir and Pinchot were successful because they worked at capturing the hearts and minds of people in an emotional way. Roosevelt said repeatedly that I accept that the people of the United States of America may utilize the resources of this nation. But I do not accept that any American should be free to use the resources of this nation in any way that impairs the enjoyment and equal sharing of those resources by the generations to come and the generations of Americans unborn. He tied the idea of conservation not to just images of wild creatures that many people had not seen, or to parts of the American West that only a handful of white Americans had ever witnessed. He tied the idea of conservation 
to the idea of citizenship, to the idea of nationalism, to be an American, to call yourself an American citizen, you had to be concerned for the conservation of these wild resources. Secondly, that team, that small, relatively small team of well-known people we know were absolutely relentless. They simply would not stop. If it took 15 years to get a piece of legislation through on fur seals, that's what Grinnell did. If it took 20 years to stop the sale of wildlife, dead wildlife in this country, that's what it took and that's what they did. If it took repeated efforts and failures and repeated efforts and failures to accomplish these goals, that is what they did. And it didn't matter that they were rich blue bloods from the American East. It didn't matter that they were politically connected. It didn't matter that they had the pens of journalism and they also had the offices of high power. They relentlessly pursued these ideas. And the third thing they did, out of many, the third thing they did was they did not differentiate between classes of wildlife or classes of people who cared about classes of wildlife. So yes, Roosevelt was a hunter. He loved to hunt. He was also an extremely keen birder. He was an individual who loved birds, loved them. There are all kinds of stories of him breaking out of his office, the Oval Office, and running out to hear the first warbler that had come back in spring. He had study skins as a child in the drawers of his bureau where he kept study skins of birds and small nests filled with little mice. We make him out to be this individual who spent his life, you know, doing good things but mostly harvesting in the rugged outdoor life of the hunter and the hunter frontiersman. The truth of the matter is he cared deeply about all of nature. And he didn't feel that he needed to compartmentalize his feelings for nature into big game versus, oh, I care about birds or I care about wilderness or whatever. He didn't shun John Muir when John Muir, who had the greatest wilderness prophet this country has ever produced and who has left so much to us. Did Roosevelt say, oh my, well, we won't invite them to dinner. No, he and John Muir were friends. When John Muir formed the Sierra Club, he came to the Boone and Crockett Club, he came to Teddy Roosevelt, and he said, I need your help about these issues in California. And Roosevelt and Grinnell and others said, John, we are so busy trying to protect Yellowstone and get that thing up and running properly and getting it to work properly. We cannot help you with that problem right now. So why don't you go form your own organization? And so he went and formed the Sierra Club. And we have managed over time to somehow concoct the fantasy that these entities born out of the one communion of idealism were somehow created out of two disparate views of the world. A lie, at worst, a falsehood and myth at best. Those men those men who formed the cornerstones of the conservation movement that all of us owe our positions and jobs and interests to, they did not partition. They did not partition. And the reason they did not partition was because in leadership it is not about power and authority and status and how many members you have Leadership in conservation is about never forgetting that there's one, one, one objective. And that one objective is to keep the wild others with us in the greatest possible abundance, in the greatest number of places possible on the planet. Now I ask you, I ask every one of you, and you may be parts of many organizations, good organization, doing good work. But I ask you, are they focused on the universal issue that I have just described? Or are they focused on a sectoral part of that issue? And are they, from their dialogue and from their meetings, do you get the impression that they're always thinking about wildlife 
or do you get the impression that they're often thinking more about their organization, its structure, the number of members it has, how much money it can compile? I'm a member of many of them. I respect them. I work with them. But I know what it is going to take to get us moving forward for the next 25 and 50 years in conservation in this part of the world, let alone what it's going to take to solve the problems in Africa and parts of Asia. It will only be done and only accomplished by leadership that moves from the center and that brings people together, that builds coalitions, and never forgets what the objective truly is. We can throw around all the terms we want. Sustainable use, preservationism, protectionism. They're all meaningless to me. They're just bits of ingredient that go into the stew. They're not the meal itself. We need it all. And we didn't just need it all 100 years ago. We need it all today. We need every one of those efforts working and working together to make the differences that we need to make. A great many times in these circumstances, I will hear people say that you know a particular group or a particular view of conservation said, um, you know, we are wrong because of this, but we believe they are wrong because of that. And we muddle up these debates to the extent that, as far as I am concerned, we place ourselves in a circumstance where we cannot possibly get out of them. We cannot possibly solve the discussions. I'll give you an example, because it's an important one. There is a great debate in the world of conservation about the whole idea of sustainable use versus the idea of protectionist approaches to wildlife. I call my organization Conservation Visions in the plural because I am willing to embrace any idea that gives me hope for wildlife. And that if that is a man, who, a woman who wishes to hunt or fish, or that's a man or woman who was abhorred by it, but they have ideas that they can contribute to the conservation of nature, I'm with them. But so often I hear these debates get ground down away from a leadership position into what I call an anti-leadership position. For example, Many in the consumptive use world, the hunting world, will claim that it is people in the anti-hunting world who are responsible for the turmoil and the discussions that currently occur over the use of wildlife, and also not only wildlife, but other animals. That somehow a particular organization that's formed that believes in animal rights or animal protectionism are able to manipulate the minds of all of the people in the United States of America or somewhere else in the world and convince them of a particular viewpoint. And of course, this occurs vice versa. The truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, and what's integral to the leadership for conservation to understand is that what is happening in society is that society is moving on a wide front, influenced by a myriad of influences, and is not at all controlled by one or two narrow viewpoints on any issue. We are a changing society. Rural America is not what it was 50 years ago. Family structures are not what they were 50 years ago. The aspirations of young people are not the same as they were 50 years ago. The cultural makeup of this nation is not the same as it was 50 years ago. And I could go on and on and on and on. And all of those pieces are changing. The attitudes, the prevalent attitudes, the prevailing attitudes that are expressed by the American nation. And we need to understand in this business of conservation that if we want to move that changing society in the directions that we believe are best for conservation and human livelihoods, 
that we had better stop breaking that complicated argument down into petty warfare between organizations. Petty warfare between ideologies. We will do what Roosevelt, Grinnell, and others so long ago do, did. We will do what John Muir did. We will do what Aldo Leopold did. We will do what Rachel Carson did, which is to keep our eyes and our minds on wildlife and what is best for them, the wild others who made us human. Without them, we wouldn't even have the bloody term because we wouldn't know what to compare ourselves to. They made us human. And they are the target now that fortunately or unfortunately for them, and we will determine the difference there, they are now dependent upon us to keep them on this planet. What is at stake is not the winning of an ideological war over the partitioned belief systems in the conservation movement, I do not care what organization is involved. I do not care who leads it. I do not care what its pedigree is. I do not care how young or how old it is. That is not what matters. What matters is we need to explain to the American people and the Canadian people and the people of this world everywhere that what we are fighting for is the maintenance of creation. What we are fighting for is that there will always be the possibility, even if they never see it, of elk in alpine meadows in the morning sun, that there will be the chance of seeing grizzly bears moving on flats and through brilliantly colored shrubbery in the fall of Alaska, that we will be able to witness the huge ungulates that move across this continent, the great moose and the caribou and so on, that have enthralled and kept our lives conjoined with nature for so long and maintained so many of the cultures of mankind. It will be that there will be places left, left in purity, untamed, unbroken, unsullied for future generations. People can understand these ideals, but someone has to bring them to them. The American people at the turn of the 20th century were not clamoring for the conservation idea. It was brought to them, brought to them by people who carried it in their hearts and carried it in their minds and refused to accept that the prevailing pressures against conservation would not succeed. You have in this country the greatest possible inspiration and the greatest possible reason to believe that we can do it again. We can do it even better. And we can plan for the conservation of nature in the United States of America and the rest of the world better than we currently are. To be defeated in this, ladies and gentlemen, to be defeated in this, to lose ourselves, because without them, not just the boy from Newfoundland, but without them, your lives will be emptied of something irreplaceable. You may not think of the small bird that chirps in the morning on your way to school, on your way to class. You may not think so much of the deer you saw on the field that evening. You may not be preoccupied by these things. But I guarantee you, if we ever lose them, you will remark how silent and alone this world is. Leadership will take us in the direction away from that. Thank you very much.